Welcome to the 11th video in this series on creating atmospheric nighttime visuals in V-Ray for Rhino. In this video we're going to be looking at how to add in render elements into our file so that when we render out our scene we have different elements of our image to be used in post-production. Now render elements are found in the frame buffer under this little RGB icon here and by default you'll just have the RGB and the alpha inputted. Now if we select the alpha, you'll see just a white image and actually this would be black and white, but we have our image full of objects in the scene so it's not got any kind of pieces which aren't taken up by geometry, which is why it's fully white here. Now to add in more render elements to break our scene down into its composite parts, we need to find these in the V-Ray Asset Editor here. And to add in a render element, all we need to do is go into this little icon that looks like a stack of paper, render elements, left click here and here you'll see a list of all the different elements we can render out as part of our scene. Now the first one we're going to add is this material random colour and this is probably the most important one that I'll be adding in to the scene here. You'll see that there are lots of different render elements in here to add and we're just going to be focusing on the core ones that I'll be using to post produce my image in Photoshop after we've rendered it out. So adding in the material random colour first, you'll see that it's then applied in the render elements here. And it doesn't have any objects or options to it here, but all it would do is it will apply a different colour to each of the objects in our scene. Now before we test this out, we need to first make sure we go to the settings and we actually turn off our volumetric environment because this will slightly kind of change the way that these render elements work. So what we'll be doing is we'll be rendering the scene without our volumetric environment and then we'll do another render with it added so we're going to have two versions of our scene at the end. So we're going to turn this off for now. Don't worry, once you turn it back on it will remember all the settings so you can just click it off for the time being. And then we're just going to hit the render preview here to apply our render element in. You'll see by default it's not there yet, we have to re-render our scene for that to be applied. And once you do and it starts, you'll see that it will be applied in there. Now as the render is loading up, you'll see that it starts off by being completely black. This is because it needs to take a little bit of time to load in the render elements before we can preview them. So just give it a bit of time and then you'll see a coloured version will appear on this. Now if your material random colour looks really bright like mine does, the reason for this is because we have a display correction added and if we turn that off you can see there that we've now got a random colour applied to each of the objects in our scene. Now this image is really useful when we come to edit our image later in Photoshop because it will be allowed us to select each of the objects by their colour so we can select the brown colour here and just edit each of the materials independently from one another in the scene. Now I'm going to keep the display correction on because with it turned off you'll see that my image looks way too dark there. But what that will mean is when I save it, it will actually reduce the brightness of this for me automatically. So we don't need to worry that this looks blown out for the time being. When we finally go to save our render, it will naturally kind of de-expose this particular image to allow it to be readable for us. So the material random color is the first render element we'll be adding. So let's stop the image and we're gonna add in a few more render elements now. Once you've added in your first one, to add in some more render elements, we need to go into the bottom left of the asset editor, go to render elements, and then scroll down and find them here. The second render elements we're gonna be adding are the raw render elements here. And we're gonna add in the raw light, the raw reflection, and the raw refraction. And what this is, is it's essentially each of these elements isolated from the image. So the raw light is just the light that's been isolated, the raw reflection is just the isolated reflections and the raw refraction is the isolated refraction like so. Now let's load up our preview again and have a look at these and see how they affect our scene. Now what these are useful for is that they'll allow us to take each of those parts of our scene and increase the intensity of them when we come to edit this image in Photoshop. Now if we select the raw light for example and wait for this to load up here we can see that we just have the lighting in the scene. We've got this kind of strong purple and blue colour, the white on the inside, and it's just the colours of the lights I've added into the scene. We can't see any materiality, we can't see any of the reflections, it's just the lighting. This is the same for the reflection, which is just the reflective elements, and also the same for the refraction. 
So these are really useful for increasing the intensity of these particular attributes when we come to edit our image in Photoshop. Now the next render element we're going to add in back in our asset editor under render elements is the Z depth here. And essentially the Z depth is an image that is a kind of gradient from white to black from the closest part of your scene to the camera to the furthest part of the scene. Now this distance here is given in the units you'll be using and I'm using meters in this particular scene. So we're going to set this from a near distance of 0 to a far distance of 150 which is around the distance of the building from the camera. Now if we then load this render element up and have a preview of this in the scene we can see if we select the Z depth here that we've now got a gradient of white in the foreground to black in the background here. So we're getting a nice kind of gradient in our scene and what this will allow us to do later is we can actually use this to apply more fog into the scene using this gradient of depth to make it seem foggier in the distance than it is in the foreground. Now the last render element we're going to be adding is just found under here under light mix here. And what this would do is it will actually break down all the lights in our scene as individual image files. Now this is really useful if, for instance, we want to turn on and off some lights or create an animation after we render this image out, which allows us to kind of selectively turn on or turn off or increase or decrease the brightness of certain lights. With that in, we're going to render out one last time and have a look to see how the light mix affects this image. So if we go to our render elements now, we'll see that we now have a different element for each of the lights in our scene. If we select one of them, it will just be that one environmental light. We've got the atrium light, we've got the rectangle light here. Each of the window lights are separate. And then we also have the environment without any lights in the scene as well. And then the background environment. So it's essentially split all the pieces of the image up into their illuminated parts. And this will allow us to kind of reconstruct this again and allow us to turn on and off certain lights in the scene if we want to just have certain things affected. So a really useful render element to add in levels of animation after the fact as well. So these are all the render elements I'm gonna be adding for this particular image. As I've said, it might be that you want to kind of try out more of these and by all means, go and have a look through each of these render elements, see what they do and see if they're useful for your particular workflow you're using. We're now gonna finish this off by rendering out our scene at high resolution. To do this, we're gonna go into the settings panel. We're gonna go into our render output set the resolution of our image which for now I'm just going to have a 1500 by 1500 pixels. This is a kind of medium resolution and if you want it higher I'd always aim for a kind of 3000-4000 pixel image for a final render. This will obviously take longer because of the amount of pixels you have so the higher the number of pixels the longer it will take to render but it's worth allowing it to kind of render for a good period of time to give you a high quality image that you can print to large sizes as well. So once we've set that and we're ready for it to render, we're also going to make sure that under the renderer we set this off interactive, so it's not on interactive anymore, and that will allow us to go to this quality panel, tick on the time limit and set the time limit we want it to render for. And depending on when you're rendering your image, you might have seen it might take you a lot longer to render than others. You might want to give it a different time limit. I'm just going to set mine for 10 minutes for now. And this will mean that after 10 minutes, the image will stop. If we want it to automatically save as well, we can always click on this save image under the render output, give it a file path and a place to save to. Like here, make sure it's saving as a JPEG there and then it will automatically save to that location as well. So that's quite a useful thing for us to allow it to automatically save once it's hit that 10 minute limit. And once we're done, we're just gonna hit the teapot. Now, not the one with the green arrow, because that's the interactive version, just the normal teapot, which equals the kind of main render settings. And it will now render out our image at high resolution for us there. I'm gonna let this image render out now and pause the video and then we'll have a look once it's saved at the image files we then have. Now the image has finished rendering, we can find the results that have automatically saved into our file here. 
and here you can see we've got a separate image for each of these kind of files that we've rendered in our render elements so we've got the main image that's rendered out here but then we also have the materials the raw light each of these component pieces and these would be really useful when we come to post produce the image in the next video using all of these render elements together to intensify certain elements of the image and really kind of pull the final image together now what we're also going to do is because we had to turn off the atmospheric fog in order to render out each of our render elements, we're now just going to do another render where we turn that fog back on just by turning back on that volumetric environment and then hitting that render button to render this out as well. It might be before you hit this you just want to kind of rename the file path just so it doesn't overwrite itself in there and we'll call this one fog. Save this as a JPEG as well. Hit save and then we're going to render that out. So now we've rendered out both parts of this image, both the render elements without the fog and the one with the fog. And in the next video tutorial, we're going to be looking at how to take each of these images we've rendered out, pull them all together and post produce them into our final render. So thank you for watching the video and look forward to seeing you in the next one.